Okay, so second half of our program, I'm going to turn it back over to Bill once again. Hey, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, minor correction is not the second half, it's more like a third compared to the, the first part. Part two. Okay, finding celestial objects. This is actually a big deal with amateur astronomers because once you get your telescope out and learn how to set it up and aim it at things, uh, the problem soon arises is what do you aim it at? There are only so many planets you can see at any one time, and generally, the, when we go on observing sessions, the moon isn't even up. So we need to be able to find other things as well. And even though you may not have heard of a lot of these things yet, they will turn out to be some of the most interesting things in all of astronomy and some of your favorite objects to look at and show off to other people. And when you show them off to other people, part of the joy of that is explaining to them what it is they're seeing. Otherwise, it looks like a little gray smudgy thing. But if you tell them the story about it and the life cycle of a star, that means a lot more to you and them. So that's our goal in finding celestial objects is being able to find a variety of things that illustrate various concepts in astronomy. First, it's important to know your way around the sky. Even if you have a computerized telescope that will find things at the touch of a button, you still need to know what things are up at a given time and to learn some of the major constellations so that you know what objects are approximately where. So if there's a cloud sitting over one area, you know to hold off on that particular set of objects and look at something else for a while. Or even I've seen people try to find things that weren't even up and the, uh, they fix the glitch on telescopes now, but for a while you'd see them start to aim down below the horizon and grind against the mounting. So uh, you can avoid embarrassment like that by at least knowing whether things are up or not. So using a sky map is a lot easier than you might first think because it is the link between not being able to see anything and being able to look through the telescope. It's the first of a series of links. Looking at a low resolution star map like the ones I just handed out will give you a, a good idea of what things are going to be up because many of them are marked on the list. Not everything, but on the sky map you'll see a number of things that you probably haven't looked at already. You don't have to learn the whole sky in one night. There are 88 constellations all together. Some of them aren't even visible from here. Others are not worth looking at. You know, two stars, fifth magnitude stars, that's not worth uh, wasting your time looking for. Just like there are 88 keys on a piano, you can play a lot of music without using all 88 keys. So you can learn a lot of astronomy and a lot of sky without learning all 88 constellations, just the main ones. So, and the best way to do that is not to go out to the dark sky observing site because you'll see thousands of stars and it'll be just overwhelming. If you use a moderately lighted area, like not right out here because you'll only see maybe first magnitude stars, but uh, go to an area where you can, like Shelby Farms, where you can see first, second, third magnitude stars and that will correspond to what you see on the kind of star map that I just gave you. Low detail star map. Uh, besides being handed out for free at every meeting, we also have them in our Messier guidebook. I meant to set that out. Let me get those out here. Again, some people have very expensive book carrying devices, but okay. We have two guidebooks for finding the Messier set of deep sky objects. The first has got 50 in it, and the second has got the other 60 because they're 110. They're not the first 50 and the last 60. They're 50 kind of easy, obvious ones, and then some like the 
second tier objects that are some of them are really just as good but just uh, a little bit harder to find so after you do the first ones start in on the second ones but what the reason i was going to mention that is because in the back of each one of these books is a set of 12 monthly sky maps along with the chart that shows you which ones to use when now that's not as obvious as you might think because you're not going to use a January sky map tonight all night long. If you're out after midnight, you might be using an April map. And just before sunrise, you might be onto the July map. So uh, the time of day due to the rotation of the Earth and the month of the year due to the revolution around the sun, those two motions combine to tell you which star map to use. And those are built into each one of those books. Okay, if you look at the sky map, around the, the circle that the map is drawn on represents the horizon all the way around. And the primary cardinal compass points are indicated north, east, south, west. The first thing you'll notice is that if you hold the map with the north in front of you, and then of course south will be behind you, West is to your right and east is to your left, which is backwards from what you would expect a land map to be. That's because this isn't a land map. It's made to be used overhead. So if you hold the map over your head with north in front of you and south behind you, then east is to your right and west is to your left, just as the sky is over your head and corresponds to those directions as well. The center of the map represents the zenith, or as most people say now, the zenith, ever since the TVs came out. Uh, that's a battle that's not worth fighting, but strictly speaking, it is zenith rather than zenith. <laughs> the constellation names on the map are printed in all capital letters, whereas the star names are start with capital letters because they are names, but then switch to lowercase. So if you look over in the eastern part of the sky, you'll see the constellation Leo, all caps coming up, and the bright star Regulus in the heart of the lion, indicated with the lowercase letters. Whichever way you're facing outdoors, hold the map with that side down, and whatever you see on the map in that direction is what you'll see in the sky in that direction. You don't try to see the whole thing at once because you don't have 360 degree fish eye eyes. So you can only see part of the sky at once. So whichever way you're looking, if you turn around and face towards the west, turn the map with the west side down, and then the constellations over the western horizon on the map are what you will see in the western part of the sky and so on. Learn the major constellations first and use them to help you find the others. That's the best way to learn the sky. Not considering each thing as a separate entity, but as part of a whole. For example, if you look at Orion, if you hold the map with the southeast side down, it's permissible to slant the map. Hold it the southeast side down, up two and a half inches or so from the horizon, you'll see the constellation Orion. And the giveaway to Orion is the three bright stars in a row. We saw a photograph of them in the time-lapse picture a little earlier. The three stars in a row that form the hunter's belt. The bright red star, Betelgeuse, in his shoulder. And Rigel in his heel, a bright blue star. Stars do come in different colors, indicating their temperature, of course. Most, uh, a lot of people know that. It's similar to types of flames on the Earth. A red glowing ember is like a fire just about to die out and a blue flame of a acetylene torch much hotter and a birthday candle yellowish in between like our sun. So the colors of stars correspond to their temperature. Notice that Orion's belt points downwards towards Sirius, the brightest star in the sky in the constellation Canis Major. And if you follow the belt of Orion upwards, it points very close to Aldebaran, the orange star at the eye of Taurus the bull. The V-shaped group you see there near the middle of the map is, represents the head and face of the bull, and Aldebaran is his glowing red-orange eye. 
And if you go straight north from Orion, you'll run into the twins, Castor and Pollux, the constellation Gemini. And uh, so on around the sky. You can use the, any of the constellations to help you find the others. The most famous example of that is in the northern part of the sky. If you hold the north side down, you see the Big Dipper coming up over in the northeast. The two stars on the outer edge of the bowl, which is the top right here in this orientation, those are the pointers because they point towards Polaris, the North Star. So that'll help you get your bearings in the sky. Uh, Polaris, a lot of people think the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, but it actually comes in about 26. So don't look for the brightest thing in the sky and head that way thinking you're going north because it won't be. Mm -hmm. The uh, North Star is a second magnitude star, which is respectable brightness, but there are a lot of others uh, brighter. Um, We'll take a look at a few of these things as we go, but we're, the purpose of this is not to learn all the constellations tonight, but just to see how to do that. Take this out to a moderately lighted area like the Shelby Farms and follow, find something that you can identify and use it to lead you to everything else. And forget the little teensy things. Like over here in the southwest corner of the sky, you got Fornax, uh, three fourth magnitude stars. You pretty much forget that, the furnace. And uh, Selim, the engraving tool, we forget that one. But look for the ones that are made up of bright stars that have an interesting mythology associated with them. And above all, lots of good things to look at in them, these M objects that we'll get to shortly. So if you know where, say the M42, back to Orion again, you see if you look uh, just below Orion's belt towards Rigel, you see a little ellipse marked M42. That's the great Orion Nebula. We'll see a picture of that and see how to find that in the telescope coming up. But uh, learn that that's there and that that's something you can see and is very much worth seeing. So any of the ones on the map here, you can imagine, since there are not that many things on the map, if it's on here, it's probably worth your while to look at. And here's a fundamental principle. If you can't point your finger at something in the sky, you can't point your telescope at it either, unless you're using a computer to do it. And then that uh, counts, but in a different way. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's... It achieves, look at it. It's just, it achieves the end, but in a different manner. Sort of like if you go fishing and you catch a fish, you bait the hook, throw it out, haul them in, take them home, clean them, cook them, eat them. Or you can go to the fish market and buy an already prepared fish. Uh, either way, you get to eat fish. But you don't say you caught it if you went to the grocery store and got it. It's a whole different thing. So for those of you who are interested in the thrill of the hunt, that's what we're going to be looking at here, how to find things without using a computer. I'm not against anybody doing it, of course. It would be pointless because, you know, just being against somebody doing something doesn't have any effect. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not against the idea of it. Uh, if that's the way they want to do it, that's fine. It's just not my cup of tea. And after fooling with a computer all day, the last thing I want to do going out observing is fool with computers again. So I, I would much rather just do it uh, in a little more natural and peaceful manner than clicking and buzzing and all of that sort of stuff. So now finding objects with your telescope. There's a, a step kind of missing here, which we'll look at in just a moment. But here's a thing that you need to be aware of and that for the most part, finding things with a telescope is not drop dead easy. If it were, anybody could do it, and then it wouldn't be worth much. So like anything that's really worthwhile, it takes a certain amount of practice and skill and patience and getting used to doing it before you get good at it. But you will if you keep doing it. But it's not going to be, you don't go out the first night and find the, the North America nebula. You're not going to do that, nor should you. Look at bright, easy things, work your way up. And, to, and as you gradually get better, go for harder things. I could probably use some exercise analogies there if I knew any. I don't. <laughs> <that's> not, <laughs> okay. If you think it's going to be easy and you discover it's not, 
that's all it takes for a lot of people just to give up. So get over the first hurdle and that, uh, then you'll have a lot of fun after that. The main problem is deciding what to look at after you've seen the moon and planets. Some of the most rewarding things are among the hardest to find. There are things that took me months to find the first time I was looking for them. And when I'd finally find them, I'd backtrack and write down in reverse order what I did to get to them. And that's how these books came into being, was how to find things. Uh, of course, there weren't any computerized telescopes then, but uh, had there been, I wouldn't have had one. Uh, this telescope cost $75 of yard cutting money back in 1957 and uh, I still use that more than anything else. It's, it's not the biggest telescope in the world but uh, probably more people have looked through it than almost anybody's telescope. Uh, after a while you won't need the directions for everything. You work out your own. Everybody gets their own expertise in different ways and it's Certainly nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's to be desired. One of the, here's the, what, the third fundamental principle of the universe that I'm giving you tonight. The third one is give yourself a fighting chance. If you're trying to find something with a telescope, make sure that the optics are collimated or lined up. Otherwise, everything will look fuzzy. If everything looks like a planetary nebula or a comet, you can't find the real planetary nebula or comet amongst all of the stars that are supposed to be little sharp points. And as I said, I might be able to do something on that later on during the year of how to collimate the telescope. And get a straight through finder and make sure that it's aligned so that when you see something in the finder, it's gonna be in the eyepiece. Because most of the directions involve looking through the finder. And that will allow you to uh, go seamlessly from the sky map and I put one more step in use binoculars see if you can see it in the sky and then use the finder of the telescope and then through the eyepiece of the telescope so sky map binoculars finder and telescope if you look for everything in that sequence of events you'll have a lot better luck than if you just go straight to the telescope also, as I already said in the first part, for an equatorial mounting to work, you have to aim the polar axis at the North Celestial Pole. Otherwise, it'll be going catawampus against the motion of the sky, and you need to have it be able to find things north, south, east, west, and then track things as they move towards the west. So aim the polar axis at Polaris as we had in the first part. Incidentally, all of these things are on our website we have a uh, if you click on the MAS website memphisastro.org uh, there's a thing about need help with a new telescope just about everything I'm going tonight is uh, written out and is on our website in case you haven't been taking copious notes as we go oh yeah align the crosshairs with the celestial coordinates uh, if you want to make sure that if you go straight south uh, in the sky, uh, the stars will follow the north-south crosshair. If you go east and west, they should follow that crosshair. That just involves aiming at a star kind of near the celestial equator, like Orion's belt, and loosening the mount of the finder just a little bit so that you can rotate it and then move in either direction on one of the axes. And if things go diagonally, like here's a crosshair and the stars are doing this, we'll turn the finder so that things are going parallel to the crosshair. Then of course, if you move on the other axis, it will be moving parallel to the other crosshair. And that aligns your crosshairs with the grid line marks that are on your star charts. So everything will line up uh, and not have any unexpected directions. And you say this one looks like it's just south of here. Well, you move there and it's going diagonal. You don't want that to happen. So, Again, all of these things are things I learned the hard way over a long period of time. So I'm trying to save you a little blood, sweat, and tears. Okay, this is how to do that. I already just said that. Then you might have to touch up the alignment of the finder with the high power again after you've loosened it. But if you loosen one set of screws 
and turn it, if you tighten those same ones back up, it ought to be pretty much back where it was. Okay, follow the other direction. Okay, on to finding the sun. A lot of people like to observe the sun. One of our members, Bill Wilson, has observed the sun every clear day for uh, decades. I uh, hope he hasn't forgotten how in the last month, but, uh, <laughs> but he observes the sunspots and reports the count to the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and it has a lot of scientific value to the keeping track of the activity of the sun and what it's doing. So you have to be able to find the sun. Well, it's one of the easier things to find if you do it right. One, the easiest thing to do is to cover the finder. I usually use a, a little uh, pill bottle that slides right over the top of the finder. It uh, is kind of amber in color and it lets a little bit of light through, but it keeps curious children from looking into the finder. Because even though this is only an inch in diameter, it gathers, what, 16 times more light than your eye does. And you don't want to look at the sun with your unaided eye, much less with 16 times as much light coming through that. Or a huge amount more with the whole telescope. So cover the finder so that somebody can't look through it. Then minimize the shadow of the tube on the ground. If you plunk the telescope down out in the sunlight, which you should do if you're going to look at the sun, it'll be casting, the tube will be casting a shadow on the ground. Turn the tube around till the shadow is minimized, which means it's aimed right at the sun. And at that point, you should be able to see light coming out of the eyepiece of the telescope. Don't look in it at that point. Never ever look at the sun through the telescope unless you really know what you're doing and are using the proper filters, which are not the little bitty ones that come with the telescope. I'll a little more about that in just a moment. Uh, so you look for the light coming out of the eyepiece and center it in the eyepiece. And then you project it onto any kind of a screen. A uh, manila folder like this is almost ideal. Just hold that back from the eyepiece, not up close, it'll burn a hole in it. But hold it a foot or so back until the sun fills the the screen that you're using and then focus with the eyepiece holder and you'll get a very nice image of the sun projected that way and more people than one can look at it at the same time which is an advantage so that's my preferred method for looking at the sun if you must look through the eyepiece there are uh, varying degrees of expense that you can go for a uh, a luminized mylar filter that goes over the front of the tube, but you got to make sure that it's securely fastened and no danger of it coming off while you're observing, or that would be uh, disastrous. Sometimes a telescope, uh, well, here's a, when we were looking at the eclipse a uh, year and a half ago up in East Tennessee, you can see that, see this little bracket right here holds a screen right over the end of the eyepiece and people can line up and take a look at it that way. Here's the solar eclipse in progress. Actually, this was right after totality. You can tell two ways there. The, the side that the crescent is on and the fact that my nose is pink from being out through the whole time. It's not just starting here, it's after the totality. Okay. Solar screen over the front, never use a solar eyepiece filter. Uh, if your telescope came with a little dark purple or almost black looking disc that you're supposed to put in your eyepiece, the best thing you can do is take a hammer and smash that to pieces so you're never tempted to use it because they're dangerous. All the light and heat gathered from the sunlight by the mirror of the telescope is gonna be focused on that one little piece of dark glass which, if it's doing its job, absorbs all that heat and keeps it from going to your eye. Well, the glass can't really take that for very long and they're prone to crack. And I saw that happen once at an observing session many years ago, decades ago. Uh, somebody had one of those in and was looking at the sun 
and he stepped aside and was waiting for the next person to go up and look at it and just at that moment you heard a little chink noise and that was that piece of glass cracking you could see sun streaming out through the eyepiece and had the person either one been looking at that time they'd be blinded permanently so don't ever use that kind of a way to look at the sun had to throw that in even though it's not a nighttime object uh, a lot of people like looking at the sun and projection is the way to go with uh, low expense to get uh, really good filters and see the prominences and everything you can spend a bundle on that but for starting just project it on a folder the moon is easy to find you can use it minimizing the uh, shadow on, uh, on the tube on the ground same way except it's not nearly as dangerous you can take the uh, cover off the finder for doing that and it, if the moon is really bright you can it feels uncomfortable when you're looking at it through a good sized telescope uh, it's not going to harm your eye but it can ruin your light uh, your night uh, vision for a while and kind of give you kind of a glow that prevents you from seeing anything else so there are ways to fix that one is with a uh, mask over the front of the tube that you just make out of cardboard and cut holes diagonally opposite in it. So you have one hole near one edge, one near the other. That lets you use the full diameter of the mirror without much light coming through. So that's one way to do it. Or you can get a little uh, moon filter and screw it into your eyepiece like the solar filter that you're not supposed to use. But for the moon, that works out fine. So if one of those came with your telescope or you bought one, then that's a good way to look at it. Okay, the same things. There, okay. Aperture stop, that's the cardboard disc with holes cut in it. Okay, for looking at other things, always use the lowest power eyepiece first. That's the one, the longest, remember, it's in the denominator. So the, uh, whatever your biggest eyepiece is, use that one first. Those of you who have taken a biology course know that you're not supposed to hunt for things in the microscope field with the highest power. You find it with the lowest power, center it in the field, and then switch to a higher power lens uh, if you need to. Same with the telescope. Always start out lowest first. This is maybe counterintuitive, but leave both eyes open while you look through the finder. There are a couple of reasons for that. It, improves your visual acuity to be seeing things with both eyes. Another is if you go all night with one eye squinched up, you'll get a cramp in your face after a while from just squinching your eyes closed. So unless you're right under a street light, which you shouldn't be anyway, leave both eyes open, use one to look through the finder, just one to look at the sky. So then you move the telescope around so that whatever the object is, the moon or planet or whatever you're looking at, starts to look like it's moving towards the finder. Of course, it's the other way around. You're moving the finder towards it, but when you're looking through the finder, it looks like things are entering the field. Now here's uh, how to find the brightest star in the sky. This is Canis Major, and this is Sirius, the brightest star, and we're aimed over here looking through the finder. Now, since the finder is a little refractor telescope, the image you see through it is upside down. So if we're looking, if this is north in this direction and south down here, then through the finder, it's the other way around. Everything is reversed. Uh, it's not a mirror image, it's just inverted. So as we move towards the object we're looking at, things look like they're coming in from behind. You'd think that you know, if you just held a tube up, uh, like a toilet paper tube or paper towel tube and moved it across the sky, moving towards things over here, they're gonna come into the field of view from that direction. But it's the opposite. They sort of chase up from behind when you're looking through the finder. That takes a little getting used to, but you know, a few minutes of that and it, you, it just becomes second nature to you. Let's see. Okay. So we use your eye that's not looking through the finder and move the whole telescope as you're looking through the finder with the other eye. Things will move backwards through the field and you'll see the object finally, the planet or whatever you're looking for, 
comes in from the wrong side, like the back side as you're moving along, it chases it from behind, comes in back here, and then you'll see uh, uh, the sky eye there, your finder eye there, and as you move it a little bit more uh, until they converge on the crosshairs. One more step and you'll center it on the crosshair so that what you're seeing with one eye through the finder corresponds to what you're seeing with the other eye in the sky. And it will be right on the crosshairs when that occurs. Then you go around to the eyepiece of the telescope and look and there it'll be. Now that takes a lot longer to say than it takes to do, especially after you've done it a few times. You just swing it around into view and look around and there it is. It doesn't take but a few seconds to do it once you get used to it. Okay, once you find an object, you probably want to lock the north-south or declination axis because you're already on the object and the only way it's going to move is westward across the sky. So you can leave the polar axis loose but lock the declination axis so you don't get off one way or the other, north or south, because it isn't going in that direction. Then if you want to, at that point, you can switch to a higher power eyepiece if you need to. A lot of times you won't. You, uh, for my lowest power eyepiece, the whole moon will fit right in it. If you want to look closely at uh, some craters on one end of the Terminator, then put in a higher power. If you're looking at the Andromeda galaxy, you probably don't want to do that because it's two and a half times the uh, two and a half degrees in diameter, five times the size of the moon. It won't all fit in the eyepiece no matter what you do. So the, you don't necessarily have to go to a higher power, but for moon and planets, you might want to. Here's a picture of the planet Mars as seen and photographed by Freddie. Uh, I can say right now that this is a better picture of Mars than I grew up with from the Palomar telescope. Uh, the technology and expertise have increased to the point where uh, all those old slides I have from the Palomar Observatory, I've still got them, but they're in a cabinet somewhere. I just use the new ones that people from the Astronomical Society send me. Okay, naked eye Messier objects. Most of the ones on this map are naked eye, like M42 and Orion. Should mention a little bit what Messier objects are, the M's on the map. M stands for Charles Messier, who was a French astronomer, who was a contemporary of George Washington. And he was a comet hunter and probably thought he would go down in history as being the greatest comet hunter. Well, the problem is that all the comets he discovered aren't visible anymore. And uh, uh, we now remember him for something else entirely. He would occasionally spot some little fuzzy object in the sky and report to everybody that he had found another comet. Well, if it stayed in the exact same place with respect to the stars from one night to the next, it obviously was not a comet because they move through the solar system because there are members of the solar system like planets and do move around. So then he'd have to, I guess, call a press conference and say, never mind. So after that happened one too many times, he decided to make a list of little faint smudgy things in the sky that weren't comets so that uh, he wouldn't make the same mistake on the same object again. And he and his friends, and some, including some after his death, eventually came up with a list of 110 things that we call Messier objects. So <laughs> sometimes in life you plan, I guess this is number four, uh, you have great plans and they don't work out, but the things that actually happen may be better than what you had planned. So now Messier, instead of just being known for finding a few comets in his lifetime, uh, supplies the catalog of wonders that amateur astronomers spend most of their time looking at. So he's mainly known for the things that aren't comets. So it just worked out better that way for all of us. Try to see the thing with the naked eye and then switch to binoculars and see exactly where it is and what it's going to look like. Because the binoculars are very similar to the finder, except they're easier to move around and you use both eyes. So 
Once you see about where it is in the sky using the sky map, see if you can find it in the binoculars because that sets you up for aiming the finder at it because it's going to look just about the same. Then do the same thing we do for the planets. Move it into the field of view of the finder, uh, both eyes open. Same thing we did until the images converge on the crosshairs. Here's some examples of naked eye objects. The beehive cluster in the constellation Cancer. M45, uh, that's the Pleiades. Everybody knows that. Six and seven are in Scorpius, a summer constellation. M35 in Gemini. And a double cluster in Perseus. We'll see some actual pictures of some of these. And I'm going to get rid of a little bit of the light for those so that we can see them a little bit better. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, there's the beehive cluster in Cancer. It's on the map. If you see Gemini, remember how we found Gemini looking straight north of Orion? We see the constellation Gemini and then Leo is coming up just on the northeast horizon. Right in between them is the little dim constellation of Cancer. And M45 is right in the middle of it and this is what it looks like through binoculars or a finder you might be disappointed if you aim your telescope at it because it's so big that it won't all fit in the eyepiece view. You can kind of sweep around and see parts of it, but it might look better in your finder or binoculars than it would in the telescope. There's the Pleiades. That a lot of people think is the Little Dipper because it is little and it's sort of dipper shaped. I, you might want to call it the Little Bitty Dipper but because we already have the Big Dipper and the real Little Dipper. So this is easily visible. It's on the map. It's near constellations, part of Taurus. If it looks like the Subaru emblem, Cause that's because it is. The Subaru is the Japanese word for the Pleiades, and they adopted the Seven Sisters cluster as their emblem many years ago. The older ones look more like it than the new ones. It's kind of stylized. Uh, it's kind of out of shape now, but the old, if you have an old Subaru, it has this on it. Here's the, the constellation Gemini, and you can compare this with your sky map. See how much more is on it. On the sky map that you have, you see Castor and Pollux and maybe five or six other stars. And you can see there's a lot more to it than there. Uh, that was one of the first things that Galileo discovered was there are a lot more stars than he thought before because uh, without the, his little bitty one inch telescope that he started out with, uh, you can see a lot more stars than you could with the naked eye. So here's what you can see uh, uh, with, uh, through the finder or binoculars in the constellation Gemini. The M35 cluster is right there. It's kind of like where Castor, find Castor's body, it's kind of like he's uh, kicking a football, and that spot right there is where M35 is. And it's visible to the naked eye. Just swing your telescope around, you'll see it in the finder, converge it on the crosshairs, and there you have it. That's definitely something worth looking at. It's one of the prettiest open clusters. And there's a, another little uh, bonus cluster kind of in the background. It's much farther away. Cassiopeia. The double cluster is in the constellation Perseus. Here's Perseus over here. But Cassiopeia, it looks like a W in the, this is a good autumn object. Uh, if you think of this as the top of a V and go down to here, you'll see a little fuzzy spot. And it's easily visible in binoculars and you can aim your finder at it and no trouble at all. Then look through the telescope and you'll see something like that two little open clusters in the Milky Way galaxy, relatively nearby, relatively young, as you can see, from all the bright blue stars that are in it. Some of them have evolved into red giants, and you can pick those out in the field. You can see the colors with the telescope. Now, seeing color at night depends on how much light is striking your retina, because the rods in your eye are more sensitive to light, but they're not sensitive to color. Uh, you need a little more light to activate the cones. So if you have a large diameter telescope gathering a lot of photons, then you can actually see what color they are 
and you'll definitely see the difference in color. If you're not sure, look back and forth between, say, Betelgeuse and Rigel, or between this cluster and the red giants over there. You'll see the difference, I guarantee it. Okay, nebulae, gas clouds, where stars form. There are two big ones of these. One of them's in the summer, so we'll look at the winter one, M42, in the belt of, or excuse me, in the sword of Orion. On the, the star map I use, one of the stars in the belt is uh, on the crease of the book, so you don't see the three stars very well there. But here's what we're looking for right there. Even in binoculars, you can tell something not right about that star. It's fuzzy. It's kind of pinkish looking. It doesn't look like the other stars. And if you aim the telescope at it, you'll see that. That's by another one of our members, Tim Vent. Um, and it kind of looks like a mimosa bloom to me. A little dark fingers sticking into it, dark nebulae, clouds of gas obscuring the bright behind there. And in a really good dark place, if you you can see all of this stuff and this whole area is kind of glowing and it isn't clouds in the sky, it's celestial clouds. Other galaxies. For a long time, astronomers thought that the Milky Way was the only galaxy. In fact, they called it the galaxy. But uh, in the early part of the 20th century, it started to become clear that these things were at such a tremendous distance that they had to be island universes like our own Milky Way. And one of the nearest and brightest is the one in the constellation Andromeda. Some people just call it Andromeda, but that's the constellation. If you look at this constellation, this is two chains of stars coming out from the great square in Pegasus. And if you go up to the second pair of stars, you'll find another star, and right next to it is another one of those little fuzzy spots. And if you look through binoculars, you'll see that it's an actually pretty big fuzzy spot. It's, uh, like I said, it's uh, about five times the size of the moon. Well, sometimes when I've said that to people, they misinterpret and they look out for something five times as spectacular as the moon. It's faint, it's just big. And if you look at it through the telescope, this is what you'll see. I've seen views like this through our telescopes at observing sessions. Uh, at first, what you're seeing in the binoculars is really the nucleus or the bright central part of the galaxy. But whatever size eyepiece you use, a big wide view if you can get it, you'll see, uh, especially if you jiggle the telescope a little bit, you'll see stars and galaxy, or, uh, dust and gas clouds jiggling all the way out to the edge of the field and lopping over both sides. Like the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy has two companions. You know, we have two companions, the Magellanic Clouds visible in the Southern Hemisphere. But uh, the Andromeda Galaxy has got a little roundish one here, M32, and then M110, the last object in the Messier catalog, is this other spiral galaxy down here. And these pictures are nearly all taken by amateur astronomers like us. These were from California. Globular clusters, there are a lot of these that can be found. There are about a hundred of them surrounding the Milky Way galaxy, uh, kind of like a halo around our big flat spiral pinwheel galaxy. And uh, some of these are really easy to find and spectacular to see. Uh, there's a person sitting very close to me whose favorite Messier object is M13 in Hercules. I've seen him standing out in the rain waiting for it to clear up so he could <laughs> look at M13 through his telescope. <clears throat> Omega Centauri is another one it's just barely visible here. It's way, way far south and it's just over the southern horizon. You almost have to stand on tiptoe to see it, but we've About seen it from, weeks out of the year. yeah, yeah. And but we've seen it from Burton's a couple of times because it you get right along the road and uh, it's aimed the right way so you can see it. M13 is just barely visible to the naked eye. So we switch now to a slightly more advanced technique and for things you can't quite see with the naked eye, but they're between a couple of bright stars that you can easily see. And the Hercules cluster is one such thing. Another one is the Ring Nebula in Lyra, which we'll look at in a minute. 
you use the same technique with the finder, both eyes open, moving things into the crosshairs, but you do that with the stars on either side of it rather than the object itself because you might not be able to see the object. So you, you find it on the star map, look at it with binoculars if you can, then through the finder, and then do the, the whole deal that we've already seen how to do. Here's the constellation Hercules, and in this keystone-shaped part, in the middle of the constellation, right there is where the M13 cluster is. And you can see it's about a third of the way from this star to this one. You might be able to get both of those in the finder, might not. You might have to go to this one and this one and then back and then know about where a third of it is. Uh, it's not critical, just get in that general area and you'll see that. This is another Freddy picture, and it's, it looks a whole lot like what we see there. Probably 100,000 to maybe a half million stars in that cluster. Ring Nebula and Lara. Uh, it, this took me forever to find when I was first starting out. I had this constellation turn around crooked, and I was looking down here instead of over here. But it's between those two stars it's very faint. You can't see it in the finder, much less with the naked eye or even binoculars. But if you can center between those two stars, you'll see it. Find the star that's fuzzy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if your eyepiece is, or if your optics are collimated, they won't all be fuzzy. The one that is, that looks like a little Cheerio right in the middle of the field, that's uh, what we're looking for. This kind of object is uh, called a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planets. What it is is a star like the sun, about one solar mass. After it's lived for about five billion years, it'll turn into a red giant and swell up and cast off a little shell, a spherical shell around itself, and then collapse back down to form a white dwarf star. So this, you see the little star in the middle is now a white dwarf, sort of planetary in size. And then the little Cheerio around it is the gases that were sent out. And this is another Freddy picture. Um, objects which are directly north, east, south, west of a well-known star. This is a, another trick you can use. If you happen to see that M41 in Canis Major is directly south of Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, you can pretty much chalk that one up. Just aim it serious, go south. So do the same thing. Just find the guide star like Sirius in the finder and low power eyepiece. Then here's a little difference. You don't try to find it in the finder. Once you've gotten the guide star like Sirius in the finder, then go to the eyepiece and move straight south and it will just sweep right into the field because you won't see it in the finder more than likely. So you can see how using the star map with the coordinates on it, these lines are north and south. Uh, there we go. These lines are north and south, and these are running east and west. And you can see from just looking at that that this cluster, M41, is directly south of Sirius. So you find Sirius in the uh, eyepiece of the telescope, finder, then eyepiece, then look through the eyepiece while you turn south, then you'll run into it. And it's also a very nice object worth looking at. And these star clusters, you don't have to have pitch black skies to see them. You can see these in town, not necessarily right here, but uh, you don't have to be in an ideal location to see those. So wrapping it up, Use a straight through finder, equatorial mount, both of them aligned properly, which gives you a fighting chance. And that takes advantage of the celestial coordinate system of declination and right ascension or north, south and east, west lines on the map and motions in the sky. Plan what you're going to look at indoors before you go out observing. If you go out and look at one or two things, what am I going to look at next and start flipping through books, you'll waste a lot of precious observing time while likely the clouds are rolling in. So get your plans in order before you start. And use the guidebooks while you're learning. And then after you gain some experience, make up your own plans for finding things. Sometimes you'll have to, like if a new comet appears 
and you have to uh, try to find it, it's not going to be on the star maps. That's a, a new interloper in the solar system. But if they give you the coordinates, you can plot that on your star map and then see this is uh, just east of Spica. So then you use our techniques to find that on something that's not even in the books. Just plot where it is, then it's in your star map. Then work out some method for finding it from there. And above all, keep records. You never can tell when something you write down many years later may turn out to be an important discovery. And also, if you keep records and turn them in to the society, we'll give you certificates at various stages of your development so as to reward you for what you've done and incentivize you to do even more. And all while you're doing it, you have fun doing it because it's a lifelong hobby. I've been with the Astronomical Society since December 57, which is uh, just over 61 years now, and I'm still learning things all the time. And I hope that all of you who are here tonight with new telescopes or about to be new telescopes uh, will have as much fun doing this as I have. So uh, I don't think we're going to be doing this. <laughs> we're experiencing some sort of a monsoon season, but uh, we can switch over to any sort of questions and answers if you want to stay around. There, you've got a whole bunch of experts who will give you different answers on everything. But uh, that's all I've got to present for this evening. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>